we're going to have the mother of all recessions. It's going to be worse than the recession of 2007, 2008, which we now call the Great Recession. So this one's going to be greater than that. So either we're going to have to rename that recession or come up with an even more ominous name for the one that we're already in, but is going to get much worse in 2023 and probably beyond. In today's video, Peter Schiff, founder, CEO and global strategist of Euro-Pacific Capital, gives a warning that the 2008 crisis was just the prelude to a larger sovereign debt crisis in the United States that may lead to a collapse of the US dollar. Before listening to him, please ensure to smash the like button and subscribe to the channel. We are running out of time for that Santa Claus rally. Only the Dow Jones finished the week in the black and just barely it eked out a gain of about 0.85 of a percent. But all the other major indexes were down, although the losses were minimal in the S&P and the Russell 2000. Those indexes were down about two tenths of a percent. But it was a rough week on the Nasdaq, which was down two and a half percent, bringing its total decline for the month of December up to 8.8%. Russell 2000 is down 6.7% so far in December. S&P down 5.8% and the Dow down 4%. Now we still have one more week to try to recover those losses and maybe get that Santa Claus rally. Normally you get the Santa Claus rally before Christmas. Although in 2018, we got a big Santa Claus rally after Christmas, but it wasn't a big enough rally to prevent December from being the worst December for the S&P and the Dow since 1932, I believe. And for the NASDAQ, it was the worst December in the history of the NASDAQ, which doesn't go back nearly as long as the S&P or the Dow. But one of the things that reminds me of December 2018 is that back then, the Fed was raising interest rates and posturing as if it was going to keep raising rates, that it was committed to this policy of rate hikes and quantitative tightening, but it maintained that stance in the face of weakening economic data. In fact, the data was very weak, yet the Fed was oblivious to that data and instead was focusing on its commitment to return to normal interest rates and shrink its balance sheet. And so because the Fed was so resolute in that commitment, the markets were tanking. And what ultimately happened is Powell pivoted in January. And that's really what started the rally in late December was the anticipation of the pivot, which we ultimately got. The big difference, of course, is back then we didn't have an inflation problem on our hands. So the Fed was able to come up with an excuse to pivot because inflation was still below its supposed 2% target. On the other hand, right now, inflation is still well above that target. And so the Fed riding to the rescue to save the market with a pivot seems a lot less likely this January than it was in January of 2019. Now, the Fed didn't immediately start cutting rates in January, but it certainly telegraphed that the trajectory of increases was going to slow down. And we ultimately did get some rate cuts. The Fed initially described them as a mid-course correction. But of course, I pointed out in real time, that was just BS. That was the beginning of the move back down to zero. And that's exactly what happened. Of course, it took a pandemic to get us to zero. But if it wasn't the pandemic, it would have been something else. And of course, we ended up with QE4, which I always knew was coming. And in fact, I always said that QE4 would be bigger than QE1, 2, and 3 combined. And I was right on that as well. So the reason that December of this year reminds me of December of 2018 is you have a similar situation where you have the Fed committed to rate hikes despite the fact that the economic data continues to deteriorate. And if we're not already in a recession, and I believe that we are, even if it hasn't been officially declared, we will surely be in a recession next year. In fact, it seems almost unanimous. Just about every analyst and every representative from any major U.S. company, they're all saying that we're going to be in recession next year. That is very rare. Normally, if a recession is coming, nobody other than me maybe sees it coming. People are extremely reluctant to forecast a recession. But now it seems like everybody has a recession in their forecast. Now, the contrarian in me 
might say, wait a minute, if everybody expects a recession, maybe we're not going to get one. Well, the reason I still think you could be a contrarian here is because everybody agrees that the recession is going to be mild. It's going to be short. It's going to be shallow. So in other words, it's no big deal. So in that respect, the consensus is still wrong because there's no way this recession is going to be shallow. It is going to be extremely deep and it's going to be long lasting and it's probably going to include a worse financial crisis than 2008. Think about it. There's no way that this recession could be mild. As I've mentioned on this podcast, recessions generally are proportionate to the booms that precede them. And those booms typically result from the mistakes that are made when the Fed keeps interest rates artificially low. And so the lower the Fed keeps rates and the longer it keeps them low, the more mistakes get made. Well, we've had near 0% interest rates for over a decade. We had four rounds of quantitative easing. The Fed inflated the mother of all bubbles. It's not going to be followed by itsy bitsy recession. We're going to have the mother of all recessions. It's going to be worse than the recession of 2007, 2008, which we now call the Great Recession. So this one's going to be greater than that. So either we're going to have to rename that recession or come up with an even more ominous name for the one that we're already in, but is going to get much worse in 2023 and probably beyond. Also, one of the other mistakes that a lot of investors make is believing that once the Fed succeeds in reducing inflation to 2%, that we're just going to go right back to those low interest rates that we've had since the 2008 financial crisis. Well, they're wrong twice. First of all, the Fed's not going to succeed in bringing inflation back down to 2%. And even if they did succeed, they couldn't immediately lower rates back down to the low rates that we became accustomed to because that's why we have all this inflation. And if they tried to bring rates back down, any progress on inflation would be lost. So in order to get inflation down to 2% and keep it there, the Fed needs to normalize interest rates and then leave them there. In fact, it actually has to get restrictive. And then once inflation is back down to 2%, we can have a normal rate of interest. But normal interest rates are above the inflation rate because nobody will normally loan money for less than the rate of inflation because you're going to lose. You have to get some type of positive return for making a loan. So if inflation goes back down to 2%, maybe rates could be 3 or 4%. They can't go back down to 1% or 0 not unless the Fed wants to unleash the inflation monster that it supposedly just succeeded in corralling. But of course, it's not going to succeed in doing that because the Fed is not going to raise rates high enough to bring inflation down to 2%, nor is the Fed going to get any cooperation from Congress because we need cuts to government spending. But we're getting the opposite of that. We just got this omnibus spending bill, $1.7 trillion in spending. This is throwing gasoline on the inflation fire. We're increasing defense spending. We're increasing welfare spending. In fact, we're increasing defense spending on the Ukraine. Included in the omnibus spending bill was another $45 billion in aid for the Ukraine, bringing the total so far this year to $113 billion. Now, first of all, to put that in perspective, the entire military budget for Russia for the year is $65 billion. So the United States alone has given the Ukraine about twice as much as Russia spends total on the war. And America is not the only country giving the Ukraine aid. The Ukraine is getting aid from Europe and maybe Asia. So a lot of money is going into the Ukraine, far more than Russia is spending to fight the war. And it seems that if our real goal was peace, which should be our goal, instead of spending all this money to perpetuate a war, we should be doing everything we could to try to organize a peace because a peaceful resolution of this crisis should be in everybody's interest. But apparently there's so much money at stake. A lot of people are getting rich off the war. So the last thing they want is peace. Another way though, to look at the absurdity of the amount of money that we are spending on this war, the 113 billion in aid thus far in 2022 amounts to about $2,500 per Ukrainian. I'm talking about all the little kids too. So for a family of four, 
that would equate to $10,000. Now, $10,000 is about twice the average household income in the Ukraine. That's how much this aid is. So to put that into perspective, for an equivalent amount of money in the United States, that would be $140,000 per family. Could you imagine the United States receiving aid in the amount of $140,000 per household? This is an absurd amount of money, and it's going to continue. There's no reason to believe that we're not going to do the same thing in 2023. In fact, it may even be bigger. The other question, of course, is where's all the money coming from? We don't have this money. We're creating it. We're printing it. We're supposedly fighting a war against inflation. But rather than trying to win the war against inflation, the U.S. is more concerned about perpetuating the war in the Ukraine. And the result is both the war in the Ukraine and inflation in the U.S. not only continue, but they'll probably get worse. But the bottom line here is that there is no interest in Congress to do anything to reduce government spending. We continue to increase government spending as if we don't even have an inflation problem. All these politicians are spending all this time talking about how bad the inflation problem is, yet not only do they do nothing to try to solve the problem, but everything they're doing is compounding the problem. They want to just point to the Fed and say, well, it's your responsibility. It takes two to tango. The Fed is not going to be able to get rid of inflation unless the government stops running massive budget deficits that the Fed ultimately has to monetize. All of this government spending has to be paid for. You know, Elon Musk ran this poll on Twitter, obviously not a scientific poll, but the vast majority of the three million or so people, obviously some of them aren't even Americans, who responded to the poll said they opposed this on the spending bill. Well, just about everybody would oppose this on the spending bill if they realized that they were going to have to pick up the tab through higher inflation, because that's where the money is coming from. The government is not raising taxes on anybody to cover all this spending. Well, that doesn't mean we get all the spending for free. We have to pay for it another way, and we're paying for it through inflation. And since inflation is the most regressive of all taxes, because it falls the heaviest on those that can least afford to pay it, the working poor, the middle class, that is the new tax system we have in America because we can't get any taxes on the rich. Nobody is willing to even support those. And even if we could raise taxes on the rich, we really wouldn't generate much revenue from the rich. They're already paying a lot of taxes and you run the risk of making them less productive and ultimately undermining the economy and the tax base. So we have to raise taxes on the middle class because that's where the money is. But nobody will raise taxes on the middle class. And since nobody will cut spending, well, then the only choice is inflation. Inflation is the only politically palatable way that government can pay for all this spending. They have no way not to spend. They have no way to raise taxes to cover the cost. So they use inflation to cover the cost. And then they blame other people for inflation, whether it's Putin whether it's corporate greed, whether it's the pandemic, they'll never run out of excuses to blame inflation on, and they will never accept responsibility for having created the inflation themselves.